Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. Watch out, 17th Amendment, I'm coming to get you. As we continue with the Constitution for Dummy series, taking a look at the words and the meaning of the Constitution, so wherever you stand on the issues of the day, you stand smart, or maybe you're just studying for an exam. I don't really care. All I know is I'm about to do some teaching, and if you hang out, you'll do some learning. So giddy up, here we go. All right, let's take a look at the words of the 17th Amendment and then we can break it down. Orchestra, music. The Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislatures. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies, provided that the legislature of any state may empower the executive thereof to make temporary appointments until the people fill the vacancies by election as the legislature may direct. This amendment shall not be construed as to affect the election or term of any senator chosen before it becomes valid as part of the Constitution. So the words itself, guys, um, in its most basic form, is direct democracy for the Senate. If you're having trouble remembering numbers, just spell the number 17. This is so stupid. S-E-V, right? Just stop it with the S-E, and at least you'll get to the issue of the Senate. But um, I'm much more interested in the meaning. So what this basically is going to change is Article 1, Section 3, Clause 1 of the United States Constitution. In the original Constitution, the Senate, which is kind of the representation of states in the Congress, and really a benefactor to the small states because each state gets two. Rather than having the state legislatures choose those senators, which was the way up to 1913, the people of that state by popular vote, by democracy, will choose it. So in a sense, we're moving from indirect democracy, because the people chose the state legislatures, I guess, to direct democracy. Now, the second part of the 17th Amendment also changes the way that vacancies are dealt with. In the original Constitution, if there was a vacancy, the state legislature had to choose the new appointment, and there could be a great lapse of time in there. So the thought was, maybe we should direct away so if there's a vacancy, it gets filled really quick so the state doesn't lose its representation in Congress. So therefore, it gives the state legislatures the authority to give the governor the ability to direct that, to pick somebody until the legislature schedules a new election so it could be popular vote again, still sticking to that original direct democracy. So that's the 17th Amendment, right? Direct democracy for the people and the vacancy issue. So let's take a look at the history. History, where are you? So the 17th Amendment was first proposed in 1823, and um, it garnered support as kind of this kind of ideal of democracy, that America is about expanding democracy, so why not expand it to the Senate? And certainly the underlying issues were corruption for many, and the idea that the Senate was kind of the elite branch of government, that they were the special interest branch that basically bought their seats from state legislatures. Um, Andrew Johnson, president after Abraham Lincoln, was a big supporter of the 17th Amendment. Um, and then as we get to the end of the 1800s, we really see the birth of populism. And populism is kind of a people's movement to kind of garner more power for democracy. Um, we see this in state initiatives and referendums, the direct primary. And I believe there were upwards of 10 or 15 states that already had direct primaries for senators in that state. So in a sense, the state legislatures were only given a candidate from each party that they could choose from. So this movement towards democracy is kind of steamrolling towards the Senate. In 1892, the Populist Party, in their Omaha platform, adopted this idea of the 17th Amendment, and the idea keeps going. It was William Jennings Bryan, right, of the uh, Scopes trial, and he ran for president as a Democrat, as a populist, kind of a man of the people. He was a big pusher for the 17th Amendment, and again, the issue was kind of corruption. This is the heyday of the Gilded Age, and if you look at the cartoon, you can see the cartoon right there. The concept is the Senate is being controlled by these special interests, by these, um, you know, monopolies and steel companies and oil barons that have the money in their pockets to kind of buy senators through the state legislatures. 
There was also this issue of kind of confusion when there was a vacancy. The Constitution directed that the state legislature would just choose the new nominee, the new senator, but a lot of times there was a lot of bickering and fighting and there would be vacancies for months and months in the Senate. So that's why that second part kind of deals with the idea of filling that vacancy really quickly. So uh, by 1912, uh, 31 states had already asked uh, the federal government to consider the 17th Amendment and there was kind of a fear, I think, from Congress that if they didn't do anything, there would be a runaway convention. So if you look at Article 5 of the Constitution, you don't even need the federal government. You can bypass the federal government if you get two-thirds of the states to kind of call for an, an amendment at a, at a convention and then three-fourths of the states to agree. You could just say, screw you, federal government, we're going to do it anyway. So the federal government, I think, is worried about this kind of runaway convention idea. So they settle down and by 1913 they bang out the 17th Amendment. And uh, there's really little opposition. There was only a few states that voted against it. So now we have it. Um, immediately we see effects. Uh, immediately we see a lot of loss of Republican representation. Um, in some states, not all states, uh, representation is not equal in their state legislatures. They have kind of gerrymandering schemes going on where rural districts are being overrepresented in the state legislatures so those rural interests are being um, you know, basically given power to choose their senators. And now when you go to direct democracy, that urban vote, that progressive or more populist vote is going to be louder. So there's definitely an effect. The effect is going to be more progressivism. The effect is going to be, in a sense, a larger share of power for the federal government, which brings us right up against the roof of the opposition. The opposition, I'm against it now. All right, so let's take a look at kind of the opposition to the 17th Amendment, which exists today amongst um, some conservatives and Tea Party members and people that see this as an issue in federalism. So shout out to my brother Larry, by the way. So if we look at federalism, right, I'm going to grab a piece of paper here. Now the basic concept um, the founders had was that, you know, power would be shared um, in a sense kind of like that where there's a little bit more power here given to the federal government, and that would be Article 6 of the Constitution, the Supremacy Clause, that the federal government is the law of the land. But then there's all these other mechanisms, like the Tenth Amendment and checks and balances, um, to make sure that that power is limited to that piece of paper. So in a sense, when we look at Congress, when we look at the Connecticut Compromise, the Great Compromise that put together Congress, the idea, the basic idea, is that the federal government is kind of represented by the people through the House of Representation, because that's direct democracy. And the Senate is in a sense the home of the states, because the state legislatures choose them. So together, they form, they together, they come together, and they make the federal government. So the opposition to the 17th Amendment basically says is you're taking away this piece of paper from the formula. In a sense, what you're doing is you're robbing that state legislature, that state voice, of their rightful position in Congress. And you're basically throwing it to the people, which becomes, there's a couple arguments against that. One of them is that that was never the intention, that democracy in a sense can be a bad thing. Mob rule, factions, loud voices, they're temporary and they change quickly. The Senate wasn't supposed to be like that, they would say. The Senate was supposed to be kind of like the wise people on the hill that would say, chill people. This is the constitutional right way to move forward. And representing their local interest of their states, they would in a sense be the brake pedal to the gas pedal that the House held. So the argument is once you change that formula and you make everything nationalized, so when you're running for Senate, you're not running on local issues so much. You're not saying, you know, elect me because I'm going to deal with this issue downstate or upstate. You might say some of that, but you're mostly being asked about national issues, about, um, you know, the, the economy and foreign policy and these big, big issues, which means that you're representing not the state as much as the federal government. And then we're going to see, according to this argument, more federal intervention, more federal growth. Right? And there's people that are for that. People say that that's necessary sometimes because the states aren't dealing with issues. We need the federal government. And then, of course, that other side is going to be that's tyranny and bang, bang, you have your ideological battle. 
Another argument is that this is actually in violation of another part of the Constitution. Um, people who are opponents of the 17th Amendment point to the fifth article of the Constitution, the amendment procedure itself. The formula has gone through about how to amend the Constitution. There's actually kind of a little part at the end there that says, don't mess with equal suffrage of the states in the Senate. Don't you mess with that without the state's consent. So there's that argument that some states have not given the consent to the 17th Amendment, so therefore that disallows this idea that we're taking away their equal suffrage. Uh, there's people that would say you still have your equal suffrage, but the formula is different. It's direct democracy against indirect democracy. So there you go guys, that's the 17th Amendment, check it off the list. And if you haven't checked the list out, that would be the playlist for the Constitution for Dummies. So if you click my chitty chin chin, I promise you, you'll be going off to that playlist and be learning like a bandit. And if you haven't checked out Hip Hughes History and subscribed, you can do that by clicking my moving hand. That's right, click the moving hand and subscribe to Hip Hughes History. It's like magic. All right guys, so glad to do the teaching. We hope you did a little bit of the learning where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you next time.